Quit depending on me, you lazy person. I've been loyal to Thomas for more than 20 years, despite everything. Is this what Thomas has been thinking all along? I wasn't depending on him. I was just trying to help. But now, I'm speechless as I lose my strength, Thomas. Ryan's grown up and has a job now. You don't need to rely on me anymore, right? But that's enough. I don't want to hear any more excuses. His voice gets louder. In that moment, I realize it's over. My feelings will never get through to him. Something inside me breaks. It's like the love that held my heart together just snapped. That bond just broke, and along with it, my love for Thomas starts to fade. Just a while ago, we were married, but now he feels like a stranger. It's obvious he's been using me, never really loving me. If he truly cared, he wouldn't cheat and try to kick me out like this. I don't care about him anymore. No, I need to bring him down completely. I decide it's time to lift my head and look Thomas straight in the eye. I'm Mila Smith, a 50-year-old housewife. Thomas and I have been married for 25 years, and our son Ryan just graduated from college and started working. With parenting duties winding down, I was looking forward to pursuing my own interests. That's what's on my mind right now. But there's a problem, my relationship with Thomas. He's far from being a good husband or father. Actually, it's hard to find anything good about him. He cheats and he barely helps with our expenses. Can you at least contribute what you're using from our household? He always argues back like this. Maybe it's hopeless. Maybe divorce is the only choice. I've been considering it more and more lately, but it's not easy to bring up. I'm also bound by a promise to my father and ma, who's in the hospital. He's done a lot for me and I feel like I should endure things for as long as I can. I want to respect his wishes but my desire for a divorce is getting stronger. Caught between these conflicting feelings, I find myself thinking about the happier times before we got married. Ironically, what sparked those happy memories was a misfortune that happened to my father back home. Our family ran a small diner where my dad cooked and my mom served. The food was always delicious, no doubt about it, but my dad was terrible at the business side of things. He just wanted to feed people good food until they were full, and that's why he started the diner. I think that's a noble cause. But he ran it purely on that sentiment, hardly ever thinking about making a profit. As long as the customers left satisfied, that was all that mattered to him. That's the kind of business it was. Naturally, it wasn't very profitable, so our family's finances were always tight. But even as a child, seeing customers leave happy made me proud. That's why I never interfered with how my dad ran the diner. However, during my college years, a crisis struck. The company supplying ingredients to our diner went bankrupt due to the recession. We had already paid for this month's supply. If this continued, we might have to shut down. Our diner was already financially tight. We had no extra funds. Seeing my parents so disheartened made me anxious too. But as a college student, there wasn't much I could do, and I doubted the bankrupt company could refund us. Closing the diner seemed like the only option. Then a regular customer spoke up, close the diner? With food this good, that would be such a waste. But with our supplier going under, we'll end up in debt. He offered, then let me personally help you out and use that to get back on your feet. The man indeed lent a significant amount to my dad. We're so grateful. We'll definitely pay you back. Don't worry about the money, just keep making delicious food, the man said before leaving quickly. Being with you, Mila, is fun, Thomas said. I feel the same. A good serious girl like you, Mila, I consider marrying, I replied, swept away by his simple words. I started dating Thomas with marriage in mind. He continued to manipulate me in various ways, and a few years later, we ended up getting married. Back then, I had no idea it was all Thomas's trap. He seemed genuinely kind, and I felt loved by him. But it was all a lie. As soon as we got married, Thomas showed his true colors. Here's this month's paycheck. Make sure you manage it well, he said, handing me an envelope containing a handwritten pay stub. Nowadays, that's almost unheard of, but 25 years ago when I got married, computers were just becoming common and handwritten statements weren't unusual. It's over $2,000, so this should be about right. I muttered to myself, managing to get by with that modest amount of money. As our married life continued, I gradually started to feel something was off, especially with Thomas's daily routine. He left the house at the same time every morning, but his return time was always unpredictable. I'm busy with various jobs as my father's successor. Then could you call before coming home? Stop nagging. Fine, I'll call, he replied loudly. His attitude made me feel even more uneasy. 
I couldn't confront him because I hated being yelled at. In the end, despite my suspicions, I remained silent. Eventually, Ryan was born. I had hoped that having a child would bring some changes, but Thomas's attitude remained the same. Looking back, I think that was when I started to consider divorce, even if just vaguely. Then, when Ryan was in middle school, I received a call from my mom while out shopping for dinner. What? Dad's in the hospital. It was news of my father being hospitalized. I rushed to the hospital in a panic. Mom just exaggerated on the phone. My dad said with a hearty laugh. I was relieved, but in that moment, I realized something and my heart skipped a beat. Oh no, I forgot to call Thomas. When I hurriedly called back, I heard his groby voice. Where are you? What are you doing? Come back and make my dinner. I'm sorry, my dad. Huh? Your dad? Your own father? Thomas asked sternly. I answered timidly. Yes, he was suddenly hospitalized. What does your dad have to do with anything? You're my wife, Thomas yelled, and I flinched, closing my eyes. I'm terrified of his shouting, but I knew I could have just stay silent. I gathered my courage to talk back. Isn't it okay to be worried about my dad? That's the least I can do. Shut up. Don't talk back to me. No, let me speak. If it were your own father, you'd rush to him, wouldn't you? I asked. Thomas suddenly fell silent. I thought putting it in his shoes would make him understand, but his response was beyond my imagination. Ha! Huh. If my dad was in the hospital, I'd ignore it. After all, I wouldn't be troubled if he wasn't around. I was speechless. This had to be a lie, but I couldn't deny it. After much hesitation, I told Thomas, I'm different from you. Sorry, but you'll have to eat out tonight. That was all I could manage to say. I hung up the phone, still in a daze. Since that incident, I really started to lose faith in Thomas. It was then I finally realized that the happy times before our marriage were all an illusion. Ah, I get it now. Thomas didn't want a wife, he wanted a housekeeper. I said to myself, feeling a wave of sadness. But I couldn't just wallow in sorrow. That's right, if I'm going to get a divorce, I need to start preparing. So I began to prepare for a divorce. A few years passed and then my father-in-law was hospitalized and his condition was quite serious. He might not be able to leave the hospital. I told Thomas what the doctor said, but he didn't seem bothered. So, it's going to cost money. Is money all you're worried about? Don't you understand the situation? I get it. I'll talk to my brother. He reached out to his brother, who was married but childless, hoping he could help with the hospital expenses. Can't you pay for it? We've got Ryan and Mila to think about. It's tough for us, Thomas said, as if it wasn't his concern. It reminded me of when my own father was in the hospital. Thomas clearly didn't care about his father either. I couldn't take it anymore. Enough. I'll figure out how to manage the hospital bills myself. Don't forget what you just said, Thomas shouted back at me. I nodded firmly. In the end, my words led to us covering the costs of my father-in-law's hospitalization. Furthermore, my father-in-law stepped down from his position as president due to his illness, and Thomas took over the role. However, Thomas didn't appreciate my intervention. Since then, he rarely came home. Even when we needed to discuss Ryan's future, he ignored my calls and stayed away. Dad's not coming home again tonight. I'm sorry, Ryan, for the trouble. It's okay. I don't care about Dad. I want to go to a university in New York, right? You mentioned that. Don't worry about the tuition. I'll take care of it soon enough. With Ryan's move to New York for university settled, Thomas didn't even see him off once. As Ryan left, the house felt emptier. By then Thomas was only coming home about once a week. Can't you deposit a bit more for your father's hospital bills? What? I already transfer over half of my salary. That should be enough for you now. The amount he transferred was just a small sum, obviously a fraction of his salary. His claim of transferring more than half was clearly a lie. I knew that already, but I just didn't have the energy to complain anymore. Years went by, and then I received news that Ryan was going to start his job. Ryan's got a job now, so it's probably a good time to bring up divorce. Over these years, I had prepared everything needed for a divorce. All that was left was finding the right moment. Where and when could I bring it up without causing too much trouble? These thoughts kept running through my mind. It's not about whether it causes trouble or not, I said to myself with a self-deprecating laugh. One day, after visiting my father-in-law in the hospital and having the casual chat with him, I returned home as usual. When I tried to unlock the door, I realized something startled. The door was already open. Could it be a burglar? I peeked inside the house apprehensively. 
then heard the sound of the TV and Thomas's laughter coming from the living room. So Thomas was home. Relieved, I entered the living room where Thomas was laughing loudly while watching TV. You're home. Yeah, thought I'd do some cleaning up around here. Cleaning up? I asked, looking around. On closer inspection, I noticed some items were missing. Something seems missing. Yeah, I threw some stuff out. Your stuff? I threw out my things, I guessed and rushed to my room. The room was empty. My computer, TV, even my favorite mug. All gone. The bed, everything was missing. What's the meaning of this? Didn't need them anymore, so I threw them out. Didn't need them. What am I supposed to do now? I raised my voice. Thomas frowned, looked away, and sighed. What can I say? I'm tired of supporting you. What? I'm your wife, I retorted. He got angry and raised his voice. Do I have to spell it out for you? Stop leeching off me, you deadbeat. For over twenty years I thought I had been devoted to Thomas, and this is what he thought of me. I wasn't leeching off him, I was just trying to be a supportive partner, but I couldn't find the words to say that as I felt all my strength drain away. Thomas continued speaking. Now that Ryan has a job and is an adult, you don't have any reason to leech off me, do you? But, quiet, I don't want to hear your excuses. Thomas raised his voice. I realized it was hopeless, my feelings were getting through to him. At that moment, I felt a snap inside me. It was as if the thread of love that connected our hearts had been cut. Simultaneously, my feelings for Thomas started to fade. We were a couple just moments ago, but now he felt like a stranger. He had been using me all along. He never loved me. Otherwise, he wouldn't brazenly cheat and try to drive me out. I don't care what happens to him anymore. No. I have to take him down completely. I made up my mind, lifted my head, and stared intently at Thomas. What? Got something to say? Nothing. If you want me to leave, I'll do just that. I said slamming the living room door behind me and heading to my room. But there was nothing of mine left. Not a single piece of clothing remained. Don't bother looking. I had the junk collectors take everything away. Which company? There's a flyer right there. I picked up the flyer from the floor and dialed the number while telling Thomas, I'll make sure you regret this, and left the house. The call connected shortly after. Explaining the situation, they understood immediately. It seemed they had sensed something was off with Thomas's behavior. They assured me that they had kept everything just as they collected it. I'll be right over, thank you, I said politely and hung up. Later. I visited the collection company. After expressing my gratitude, I had them move my belongings to a storage unit I had recently rented. Relieved that my belongings were safe, I felt a sense of ease. For the moment, he shouldn't think he can do something like this and get away with it for free. I gritted my teeth and called Ryan. I briefly explained the situation and then said, So, I've decided to move out, considering divorce. That's the plan for Ryan and me. That's okay, right? Ah, uh, okay. Bye. Ryan hurriedly ended the call. He seemed scared of me. Was I that angry? I wondered, putting my phone back in my purse. I headed straight to a nearby business hotel. In fact, I had already decided on a place to move to. The reason was simple. I had been planning to discuss divorce with Thomas soon. I intended to divorce and move there to start a new life. Well, it's just that my plans got moved up a little. Honestly, I wasn't in trouble. It was just a matter of being two weeks ahead of schedule. Two weeks living in a hotel. What a waste. I had no other choice. As a housewife, I couldn't help but feel it was extravagant. Maybe I should bill him for this hotel stay anyway. I thought, gritting my teeth. Brace yourself, Thomas. I muttered, starting to work on my post-divorce plans. About ten days into my stay at the business hotel, while having lunch, Thomas called me. As soon as I answered, he started shouting. You, you've stolen my money. Huh? What are you talking about? Don't play dumb. It's about my dad's hospital bills. The hospital just called demanding payment. Ah, that's what he meant. Sagging, I responded. You should pay it. It's no longer my concern after you kicked me out. But I've been transferring living expenses to you. You should pay it from there. Yes, but is it that passbook now with you? I retorted calmly, but I knew there was no money in that account, which made me smirk. I have the passbook, but there's no money in it. That's why I'm saying you stole it. I haven't stolen anything. Don't lie, who else could use it? He didn't seem to realize that the transferred amount was too little. Exasperated, I explained, there was just too little money from the start. If there's no money for hospital bills, why don't you use your allowance? My allowance?
Thomas started to panic, clearly thinking I didn't know about it. Since our marriage began, Thomas had been giving me handwritten salary slips to hide the fact he was taking a portion of his salary for himself. In other words, the money he skimmed was his own allowance. I once asked your father about your salary amount, so that's, he looked puzzled. But he told me, so I knew you were taking money. After I said that, Thomas fell silent. There was a long pause so long I thought the call had ended. But then he suddenly raised his voice again. What's wrong with me spending the money I earned? It's your fault for using up all the money I gave you. Yeah, yeah, and then that's it. We're getting a divorce, I'm going to demand alimony. You'll pay back every penny you used, Thomas declared. At his words, I smirked. I had him right where I wanted. Now, you couldn't escape, I replied cheerfully. Oh, thank you. I've been wanting a divorce too. Come over to my place for the divorce discussions. What? No, I mean you want a divorce, right? I'm also prepared with evidence of your infidelity, I said, knowing he must be pale, even though I couldn't see him. His voice gave away his panic. Evidence of infidelity? What are you talking about? No use playing dumb. I have photographic evidence, he exclaimed, clearly rattled. I struggled to contain my laughter. I'll give you the address. Then let's meet next Sunday to discuss it in detail, I said, and after giving him the address to a certain place, I quickly hung up. I successfully cornered him for a divorce. Now, if only I can make him apologize. That, that was the tricky part. I steeled myself for the confrontation. On the promised Sunday, I arrived at the meeting place before the scheduled time. He should be arriving soon, I thought, scanning the surroundings. Then, I spotted Thomas in the corner of my eye. Over here, I called out, waving my hand. As Thomas looked up and saw me, he was visibly shocked. Ha! Here. Yes, I gave you this address. But this place, whose mansion is this? Thomas asked, looking behind me. There stood a mansion worth about two million dollars, much larger than a normal house with a garden, three floors, a basement, a theater room, and luxury cars parked in the attached garage. Pointing at the mansion, I smiled. This is my house. It's new and beautiful, isn't it? Ha! Huh. Your house? Yes, I was planning to live here after the divorce, so I started building it a while ago. Indeed, the place I had summoned him to was my newly built house. Thomas, who had always seen me as just a housewife, was utterly astonished. Pushing him from behind, I led him into the house and guided him to the living room. Let's have our discussion. This is my lawyer, I said, introducing my lawyer who was waiting inside. But Thomas was too flustered to focus, his eyes darted around nervously, and he seemed preoccupied with his surroundings, constantly looking around. He didn't even glance at the photos of his infidelity I had laid out on the table. He was unresponsive to my conversation, making our discussion unproductive. Eventually Thomas asked in a low voice, How did you afford this house? I replied, knowing that was what he was curious about. I bought it, plain and simple. Liar? A housewife can't afford that. To buy a house worth $2 million, you need an annual income of at least $300,000. But I do have that kind of income, so I confidently answered him. I earned that much. Got a problem with that? No. But how? I was just casually helping a friend with her business, and before I knew it, it turned into this. This goes back a few years. When my father's hospitalization led me to decide on divorce, I started preparing for it and the first step was finding a job. I needed work to support myself post-divorce, so I started looking for a job that would allow me to live independently. Finding a good job wasn't easy, so I consulted my close friend Sarah. Why don't you help me with my business? Business? What do you do? Aquaculture on land. This method involves creating artificial pools to farm fish, an eco-friendly alternative that prevents ocean pollution. Of course, there were downsides, but it was also an environmentally friendly form of aquaculture that prevents ocean pollution. Sarah's father started this land-based aquaculture, and now Sarah has taken it over. So, I work there, Thomas asked tentatively. When I started helping the business, business suddenly began to thrive. My job was mainly negotiation and administrative work, and Sarah said I was a big help. Eventually, I was promoted to an executive position. It was all chance, but luck is part of skill too. Listening to my story, Thomas slumped in despair. Then suddenly, looking up, he said, Okay, let's forget about the divorce talk. How about we start over? I couldn't believe what he was saying and coldly replied, Excuse me, can you save your sleep talk for when you're actually asleep? 
No, it's not sleep talk. I really want to start over with you, Thomas argued passionately. But I knew he was just dazzled by my money, so I replied sharply. I refuse to be with someone who cheats and someone who neglects his own father too. No, about my father? Quiet, you might not know. No, but I've been paying for your father's hospital bills. Thomas had only given me a meager amount of money. After paying for groceries, utilities, and other miscellaneous expenses, there was often more month than money. That's all he ever provided. Naturally, it was impossible to pay for his father's hospital bills with that. At first, I managed somehow. But after I started working, I covered the costs with my own salary. Even then, you wouldn't listen to me or visit your father in the hospital. That's, how can I trust someone like that? I raised my voice and Thomas looked downcast. Then my lawyer spoke about the alimony. Thomas couldn't say anything and just looked down the whole time. Eventually urged by the lawyer, Thomas signed the divorce papers. The alimony was settled at $60,000. Now that we're divorced, you'll be paying your father's hospital bills, I said. Yeah, Thomas nodded reluctantly. At least he didn't argue. I felt relieved. Finally, I sent Thomas away, almost pushing him out. It's finally over. The only regret was that I didn't get an apology from Thomas. But I had one last move to make that would make him apologize. With that thought, a smile crept onto my face. A few days later, on my way back from the office, someone called out from behind. Hey, Mila. I turned to see Thomas standing there. Don't address me so casually. We're divorced now. Shut up. What the hell did you do? Thomas was red in the face, looking at me. I realized then what must have happened. Ah, so that talk happened at the company, I thought. Then I said, smiling, what do you think I did? Don't joke around. Tell me, how did you get me fired? Thomas stomped his foot. His reaction was so amusing I couldn't help but smile. He began to mutter apologies. I'm sorry, please forgive me. No, I'll be left with nothing. No job, nothing. His problems were not my concern. It was all his own doing. I won't forgive you, even if you apologize. Please forgive me, I'm begging you. Thomas pleaded, prostrating himself on the spot. I turned my back on him. Sorry, but there's nothing I can do about it. Why not? If you have the shares, I sold them to your brother and his wife after all. I don't want anything to do with you anymore. At that moment, I heard Thomas sob. Of course, I pretended not to hear and walked away. Following his dismissal as president, Thomas had to leave the company. If he had been an employee or an executive officer, he might have been able to stay. However, he joined the company through his father's connections and continued with his haughty attitude. Me, an employee. No way, he had said. So as soon as he was dismissed, he was out. Now, he's supposedly working part-time at a convenience store, but re-employment at his age might be difficult. He seems destined for a regret-filled, moneyless old age. As for me, since the divorce, I've been able to focus more on my work. I don't think I'll remarry, but there are a few men among my colleagues. Maybe a good love will come again for me. When I was thinking about this, I received a call from Ryan. I'm bringing my girlfriend over next time. Oh, that's great. I'm looking forward to it. I failed in my marriage, but I don't want Ryan to make the same mistakes. However, I'm sure he'll be fine. He's much more put together than I ever was.